Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals the podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Now this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the wonderful people at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. ASA is an organisation that works very hard to support animal studies scholars. It collects information and also shares it about conferences, funding op- opportunities, publishing opportunities and much more. Please think about joining ASA. The organisation depends on membership subs for its operation. So go to the ASA website or the ASA Facebook page today and please become a member. Right, so once again, this episode is coming to you from lovely Mexico City where it's a cool but very sunny day and I'm very, very lucky to again be joined by an international guest who it would be very uh, difficult for me to be able to speak to otherwise. So in this episode, I'm joined by Karen Dalkey. Karen is a lecturer in the Department of Public and Environmental Affairs at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And today we're going to discuss Karen's piece, which she co-authored with Megan Olson Hunt. And it's called Mustangs and Domestic Horses, Examining What We Think and What We Know About Differences. And it appeared in um, Humanimalia in 2017. So welcome to the podcast, Karen. Thanks for having me, Siobhan. So Karen, can you start by telling us why you wrote this piece? Um, I ended up writing this piece because I have been doing ethnographic work uh, with wild horses and mustangs in the American Southwest for nearly 20 years. And over that time, uh, I've heard endless stories and anecdotes about how mustangs are so much different than domestic horses. And there wasn't a lot of literature available on how wild horses act in a wild setting or how Mustangs act in a wild setting until the USGS report um, where they did an ethogram outlining 13 different types of behaviors. So it gave me something where I could then apply it to my horses at home. I mean, it's really interesting. I I kind of live my research. (laughs) So I had at that time uh, an older Mustang that had been adopted in a borough that had been in domestication for over 15 years. Um, I had two horses that were always had always been domesticated, and then we had just adopted um, two new Mustangs from the book clips. Wonderful. So, Karen, can you start by explaining to listeners who mightn't be familiar with different words that you might use to describe different types of horses? Um, so, what's a Mustang? What's a bur- is it burro? Did you say burro? Burro yeah. and domesticated horses. Okay. Well, first of all, burro is easier because a burro or an ass or a donkey are all the same animal. Um, but the way that the law in 1971 was written was termed the Free Roaming Horses and Burros Act. So that's why I refer to burros. But they're all the same animal. The burrows live on public lands. So, um, you know, most of the time people see one in a backyard or something, it's a donkey, but they're the same animal. When it comes to wild horses, they're actually referred to as mustangs. And mustangs are any unowned animal that existed on public lands. Um, They're actually owned by every American because they're on public lands. Um, I'm... They have a lot of different backgrounds. So depending upon what was released in that particular area, you can have Mustangs that look like draft horses. You can have Mustangs that look like Arabs, um, et cetera. A lot of people refer to them as feral. I find that term derogatory. Um, I believe that once we domesticate an animal, we have a responsibility to it. So I use the term liminal. Um, which means betwixt and between. Um, And uh, 
I think that pretty much would – domestic horses, I think people understand, have backgrounds, have lineages, um, are bred for certain characteristics, are bred to perform certain activities. So I think that clarifies it. So, Karen, one of the things that I think – is perhaps quite familiar to American listeners but will be less familiar to perhaps Australian listeners but I think helps contextualise what you're doing and and perhaps why you're doing it has to do with attempts to, um, I guess, round up and perhaps kill or rehome Mustangs. Can you explain why some horses are being... why some Mustangs are being um, rounded up and why some of them end up in a holding lot or...? Sure, sure. Um, Since 1971, we've had the Wild Horses and and Burroughs Free Roaming Act, which protects them as a national heritage species. For a long time, it wasn't an issue. Um, But what seems to happen is whenever there's an economic downturn, the public lands are used for multiple reasons. So you have people who have cattle roaming on these lands. Um, They pay a certain amount. I think this past year it was like $2.50 for a month per animal. Um, Yeah, and so you've also got the Mustangs, and some people are concerned that they're occupying the lands in inappropriate ways. Yeah, so it's multiple use, and what happens is the Bureau of Land Management needs to manage for multiple use, and because... Um, the Mustangs are part of that. What they will say is that their populations are increasing. What they often don't talk about is that the populations are increasing because the predators have been removed. Um, So the mountain lions, the wolves, things like that. Um, And oftentimes there's an interest in oil and gas. So companies want to go out and they want to extract these natural resources. And the horses are in the way. Um, I have a lot of concern right now under the Trump administration. Um, What happens is you adopt a wild horse. So the entire United States owns these horses. And then when they're rounded up, um, some of them are returned. If they're older or whatever, they tend to take horses under the age of five. Um, And then they put them up for adoption usually around three times. They're in short-term holding facilities. And after that, if no one adopts them, they put them in long-term holding facilities. Um, And they can live the rest of their lives there. And they look like large cattle lots. Um, And right now there's over 50,000. And because uh, taking care of them is eating up about 65% of the budget, for the wild horse program, uh, an alternative of, quote, humane euthanasia is floated again. So your interest, uh, if I've understood correctly, is to identify how these animals could be more suitable for adoption or more appealing for adoption by looking at their behaviour and how they themselves adapt to being with other horses. Is that right? Yes. There's a, there's a lot of mythology. Uh, I think wild horses um, is actually more about the type of environment in which they live rather than their temperament. But people focus on wild and, and the mystique around that. Um, and they are different. I mean, they are, are different in that they're independent. I mean, they know how to take care of themselves. Um, but I'm really concerned that there's a multiple approach to helping these animals. I think adoption's one of them. I think using PZP, which is a contraception technique, is useful. And I really question sometimes if roundups are really necessary because I've gone to the ranges when they're saying, oh, there's not enough feed and I'm, you know, there's flowers blooming and grasses are flourishing and so there's part of me that's very suspicious about that as well. So Karen you did a lot of observation of horses in your own on your own property can you tell the listeners what animals you were observing and what the process was? Sure what I did is I tried to follow as closely as possible the USGS study and their ethogram and their approach so 
what I did is I got GoPro cameras and I put them in my barn area, which they have access to. They also have access to a mud lot. They also have access to four acres. So they can move around wherever they want to. Um, and I had the cameras synced so that a picture would be taken every minute and I could see what every animal was doing at every minute. I chose to do pictures rather than video because it was discreet and I could more easily determine which behavior and how to classify it. Um, ended up over 20,000 photos. I had a wonderful student help me input all of them uh, and got some really interesting results. So we're all on the edge of our seats. <laughs> what, did, what did you find out? Well, there are some differences. Um, and I think the one thing we saw between the three groups, again, the, the, the Burrow and Mustang um, of 15 years and greater, um, the domestic horses, which had always been domesticated, and then the horses of five years or less, what we found is that less domestication um, resulted in those horses resting less, but grooming more. And when I say grooming, I'm not talking about social grooming. I'm talking about grooming themselves. So, you know, swishing their tails, uh, rolling in the sand, um, anything that would get insects um, off of them in our wonderful, humid Wisconsin summers. So basically, domestication makes you a bit lazier than you would be otherwise. Yeah, and part of that is because there's, um, well, the difference between Colorado, where our last two horses came from, um, and Wisconsin is we just have lush green areas, and it doesn't make sense. I mean, why would you move further than you needed to um, to get a good meal? <laughs> so is it the case, do you think, that the Mustangs will figure that out over time or they'll become more confident to rest more often as they get more used to living with that lush grass and knowing that there's always another meal coming? Yeah, because what we found in the study is the um, on that particular areas, uh, the Mustang and Burrow over 15 um, years of captivity and the Oles domesticated, you couldn't tell the difference, um, which shows, I mean, and this is a very small sample, I, you know, I grant that, but it does show that animals become acculturated to the particular setting. I think there's a reason, though, that might have um, helped assist with that, and we can talk about that more if you want. Yeah, well, what is that reason? <laughs> well, um, I've been following wild horses on this particular range um, in the book cliffs, and the book cliffs were part of the USGS study. Uh, they were nice enough to send me photos of my two horses as foals. But I knew the range really well, and they came from two different parts of the range. And I think one of the things that we often don't recognize is we talk about horses as a species and not as an individual. Um, Cortez, and these are the names given by the people on um, the range, was in a very brushy area, um, whereas Bandita was in a more open area. You go, well, who cares? Well, it matters because what we noticed when we brought them home is that uh, Cortez would go through anything. I mean, trees, brushes, whatever, did, that didn't matter. Um, Bandita was more alert. You know, she was always looking at the what's happening over there. She's the first horse because Wisconsin's relatively flat. You know, what's going on a mile away, right? So that was important. We also brought um, the two horses. They were in the wild three days later. They were at our house after vetting. And um, we brought them together. And I think that made a huge impact. They... they uh, we're staying with each other in this little 40 by 40 area. And it really helped me look at how they communicated with each other. Um, and because I'm not a trainer, um, I basically just tried to reenact the type of behavior um, that I was seeing happening between the two horses. So Karen, what would your message be to anyone who has the space to pr perhaps provide a home to a Mustang or two? For people who don't have a lot of experience with horses, uh, there are different prison programs. So if people say, oh, I want this horse, 
um, I would suggest go to Canyon City in Colorado. They have a prisoner program um, that I visited on a couple of occasions, and the prisoners work with the animals on everything from tying to grooming to loading to riding all the three gates. Uh, so someone who perhaps doesn't have a lot of experience, I would suggest that. I think someone who is um, a really long-term horse person um, needs to recognize that wild horses are not, Mustangs are not like the domestic horse. And one of the things they need to be most concerned with is assuring a safe place. So we had, when we brought our horses back, we had a six-foot cement wall, um, and they were confined in a 40-foot by 40-foot barn. And some people may say, oh, that's, you know, that, that's a small area. But you do it because they don't recognize the ways that they can get hurt. They don't know about wire. They don't know about fencing. They don't know about things like that. Um, and I think it would be really beneficial for people to learn a little bit about the area or visit the area where their horse comes from, even if it's done digitally, so they can see how that area looks. Because we're talking about animals that come from 10 different western states with very diverse um, geographical um, settings. That's fascinating, Karen. So I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I am so ready. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever read? I ever read um, would be R. Luke and Sanders regarding animals. Wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yes, because I started looking at human-animal interaction, um, and I went to become an anthropologist, and people wanted to turn me into a primatologist. Um, so I wrote a grant and had the opportunity to work with Washoe and the other sign language chimps and did an article with Roger Fouts on um, the use of temporary and uh, semi-permanent objects for enrichment for the five chimpanzees at the Human Communication Institute. Right. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Mark Beckoff. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was really a struggle when I was in um, graduate school for my PhD because it was sort of right at the beginning of the whole human animals studies um, discipline. And uh, you know, I talked with Alan Beck, who was in the veterinary program at Purdue, and he had suggested I call Mark Beckoff, and I called him in Colorado, and I mean, I'm a student, I'm, you know, he doesn't know me, and he spent an hour on the phone talking with me, um, and I actually didn't get to meet him in person until the first Mining Animals Conference in Newcastle, Australia, and just really thanked him for urging me to go on. Oh, that's lovely. Big shout out to Mark. So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I think being near them. I think having interactions with animals. Um, I grew up in a town and had a sort of perception of how farm animals should live or how um, pets should live. And now I live on a 20-acre farm. I think that's like eight hectares, <laughs> um, and it's quite different, the way you view things. Um, y you know, I, I see a lot of death and, you know, animals that have been injured and things that are not apparent always in urban settings. So I, I encourage people to get out and, and see animals in the environments in which they exist. So, Karen, if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human -human animal relationship, what would it be? I think I want it to go in the direction of recognizing individuality, individuality rather than, um, you know, we see ourselves as persons, and yet we still refer to all animals as a species. And we make these generalizations, um, and when an animal doesn't fit that generalization, we suddenly see it as a negative. Mm. 
So Karen, what are you working on next? I am working on an article, a chapter in a book on breed. Um, as I said before, and you had asked me, which I think is a really good question, Mustangs, I don't call them a breed because they're a mixture of breeds. And that's not a negative. Um, I mean, there's something called hyper vigor, right, where they have really strong hooves, which is always a challenge for my farrier. Um, <laughs> but I, I also want to talk about different groups that are calling things Kiger Mustangs. Um, I have no doubt they're a breed because they're selecting for a particular phenotype, but I think there's also an exploitation of the term Mustang because they can um, have people believe in the fact that they're getting a Mustang when actually it's a breed that has been uh, manipulated by human intervention. Mm, fascinating. So, Karen, how can people find out more about your work? Well, I try to post everything on Academia EDU, um, or otherwise visit the Public and Environmental Affairs at UW Green Bay. Wonderful. Well, Karen, thank you so much for coming on Knowing Animals, and thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal studies scholars about their work. Now, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or like us on Facebook at Knowing Animals. Also, have you left a review at iTunes? Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals.